And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your <laughs> one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Penny for a Tale, the lead, the lead developer of the upcoming... Dysto the upcoming dystopi the dystopian affair necrobiotic. Eh, the one and only Mitchell. Don't confuse him with Trubisky. Wallace, how are you doing today, man? <laughs> I am doing splendid. Uh, it's been a good day. Uh, I had plenty of sleep, uh, and yeah, just excited to be here. Mm -hmm. Well, thank thank you for thank you for thank you for coming on. So, I like to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd with I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what was it that made it stick? Oh, so this was uh, in 2013, 2012. Uh, my friends um, invited me over, uh, surprisingly from from church to to go play D and D, and I thought it was super nerdy, but. I didn't have anything better to do that night, so I was like, sure. Um, and so I showed up, and I played this NPC, and most of the time, um, I was on the ground prone for the whole encounter, but it was just something about it that kind of caught my attention. I, I think it, it was a weird first time, uh, and then uh, after that, Watching the movie The Wild Hunt got me into LARPing, and and LARPing is is definitely like uh, tabletop approximate uh, or adjacent, and all of that together eventually just just created this dedication to the craft that uh, that I have today. Mm -hmm. Now, with the, with that kind of th with that kind of thing in mind. Um... Mm -hmm. Were you were you somebody who ju who jumped around between different systems over over those years, or did you largely stick with a handful? Ooh, yeah, I did not get into um, any other systems until the first year of PAX Unplugged, which I think was about four years ago. Uh, I was mostly into D and D and Pathfinder, and I did a little bit of Shadowrun and World of Darkness. Uh, but I didn't really get into the indie stuff uh, until that that kind of first one where I picked up like uh, of dreams and magic as well as the Genesis. Uh, that combination there just kind of sent me down this road of of trying to play all the systems and and learn them all, um, which I, I always appreciate Pax and Plug for for providing me that experience. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um. Now when now even even with even with that going fr going from going from more standardized approaches to the several pounds of dice that is sh that is Shadowrun because le let's face it you don't do dice rolls by the die number you do it by pound <laughs> Yep yep Oh um, no, that's that's very fair like, Look some that's what that's why and anytime someone I have a rule that anytime someone says that you haven't that you already have enough dice, they're e they're either a filthy casual or they're a liar. This is true. I, I feel it's a it's a whole thing, uh, dice collecting and stuff like that. And uh, you know, honestly, it, it's it's a whole hobby mm -hmm. within the hobby. Uh, there are always amazing dice to check out yeah. somewhere, everywhere. Um, just um. Well, a supplementary to that rule: anyone trying to use non-Euclidean dice at my table will be subject to a public flogging. <laughs> non oh, like some of the 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 newer kind of weirder stuff. Somebody tried to use a D100 dice at a at when I was running um, RuneQuest a few a few years <laughs> ago. And I, I said, "You either oh, you either man. get you either get out of my house, or you have to drink the pain glass for inflicting this heresy on me." And I, I don't mean like two D tens. I mean a literal. It was like a it, yeah, D one hundred. Yeah. Oh, that <laughs> that that sounds fun. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think I've seen those around online, 
yeah, and yeah they are they are a lot. I've seen them around. I just didn't think anybody was dumb enough to actually try and bring it to me. Yeah. <laughs> but I so because of that, I ended up making him drink the pain glass, which what's the glass? It is a it is a shot glass designed to inflict pain. It is is filled with water, salt, sea salt, pepper, black pepper, oh. Tabasco sauce, Frank's red hot sauce, tiger sauce, sriracha, and ground up jalapeno seeds. Holy hell! Yeah, that does not sound like a good time. Hence, hence the name. Oh God! Yeah, uh, that. But oh man. The but the funny thing is is that go, is that going from going from more standardized dye approaches to necrobiotics um, card based system which is de- using car- using cards in general in RPGs is crazy niche. Um, what oh yeah. Tu- what tuned you on to the idea of using that? Uh, it was just kind of the um, th- there's this idea that I really like, which um, is bringing a, a deck of cards that represents your character mm-hmm. uh, to a game. Um, and I, I really like the idea of conventions and stuff like that, having that ability to do so. I also think it fits the mold of the setting a lot better than than kind of dice would. Uh, dice, in in essence, have uh, a very random aspect uh, associated with it. Mm-hmm. Um, furthermore, dice are hard to personalize, uh, in, in my opinion, and and so between between both of those, uh, the deck of cards allows customization. Um, that uh, so you can kind of have something that truly reflects uh, your your character. Uh, and then, because of the system, it becomes more of a strategic um, resource management and less than a um, the acquisition of points that allow you to specialize in a certain uh, task, much like dice does. And then you, you kind of rely on the roll to, uh, to get you there. Um, this, this is kind of just a little bit different. And, it's just it's just what I what we wanted from from the game. Mm-hmm. Now, when it, now um, speaking of that, I'd like you to talk to me about the or the origin story of Necrobiotic. How did this particular idea come to be? Yeah, so uh, and, Andrea uh, Marmugi and uh, Valerio um, Amade uh, are the kind of the, the originators of uh, Necrobiotic. Um, Valerio is a, a Italian author, and he created the setting uh, through books called uh, El Engeraggio. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there's about like five or, or six novels out right now, and the whole series has has been completed, exploring this uh, this kind of macabre world. Um, and uh, they 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 both kind of were over at the Stratagema uh, game store uh, where they started developing the uh, the kind of the gear system, what we know of today uh, that we use for um, uh, for necrobiotic. Um, and just kind of using the setting and and workshopping the the mechanics and stuff like that, it kind of eventually came out to be uh, what you know of today as uh, as necrobiotic. The the version prior to it was also called El El Ingenagio, uh, which is Italian version of the the TTRPG. Um, the art was done by uh, Stefano uh, Siom. Uh, Siom, I believe I'm pronouncing that last name right. Um, and I, I fell in love with the game uh, after a, a friend of mine brought the book back uh, from a trip to Italy. Uh, and that's when I decided, I was like, well, I want other people to play this with. So, you know, obviously I'm just going to... Um, I'm gonna figure that out and and uh, and and ensure that people will will play with me. And so that's kind of like how the whole Kickstarter and stuff uh, started out uh, with new art, updated stuff. Uh, it's kind of I like to think of it as kind of a 2.0 version of the the TTRPG, and it's like first splash into uh, the American market. All right. Now, within the within the particular the particular setup that. It, 
mm-hmm. that we have that we have here. Um, I'm the the one the one story that I that I kept coming back that I kept coming back to when I was when I was reading through the setting details of Necrobiotic is mm-hmm. Children of Men, especially especially since you're going for a cl- a a lot of classic elements of dystopia. Mm-hmm. Was was Children of Men an influence, and if if not, what um what dystopian fiction would you can would you consider influences? Ooh, so I I think Children of Men was an influence uh, from the original novels. Um, I know, um, and and I, I feel like one day we should get the other two on here to to chat with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know for for me there was a lot of influences from like Repo the Genetic Opera, uh, which is a a film I I really enjoy. Um, oh, same here. Yeah, so it's just it, it, it's beautiful. It's it's niche, um, and it, honestly, that whole um, the whole staple of of films, uh, including uh, the Devil's Carnival. I feel like you could always take some things from that and and bring it. Um. Definitely had a, had a lot of um, influences. Um, I'm trying to think if there was anything else um, that I could have, but I, I'm not. I'm, I'm not bringing up anything. I'm, I'm blanking on that right now. I'll, I should definitely ask them sometime yeah. what what their kind I, of major. I know. Ones. I know. It's. I know it's tempting to bring up 1984 when it comes to the topic of dystopias or. Um... Mm-hmm. Or even even um so- even Soylent Green, um, yeah. <laughs> I didn't bring those two up because I think that's way too easy. And mm-hmm. quite honestly, mm-hmm. well, quite honestly, it's a case of not all dystopias are created equal. Yeah, yeah. And this one, like we we like to, um, uh, I mean, obviously it's a it's a dystopia and stuff like that, and it is post apocalyptic, but it it doesn't. Uh, there's lots of things that kind of make it stand out in that there, when you first approach the game, um, there isn't that huge cloud of oppression that uh, you're kind of used to with a dystopia game like this. Um, in fact, uh, the society that uh, we present in uh, in Necrobiotic uh, is egalitarian wealth. The wealthy have been replaced by the scientists. Um, there's a respect for life, um, everyone is kind of fed and clothed and, um, and such, so it's kind of the, the kind of dystopian aspect of it is just, you know, what, what does it take, uh, for humanity to continue on it, and what have we left behind, and where do we go from here? Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of very different than, uh, some of the other, uh, bodies of work that have been out there in the past, so I'm sure there's something that uh uh is adjacent to it yeah now within the within that within that particular se- that particular setup um i'd like i'd like you to ex- i'd like you to expound upon on the idea of idea of this being a melancholic dystopia um now this might this might be a this might be a big brain disc- big brain discussion for the th- for the literary theorist which i am not which i am not highbrow enough to do i don't ra- i don't uh, raise my pinky when drinking tea um, nor nor i i i just <laughs> i just drink i just drink the damn thing um and but i would like to, i would like to pick your brain as to mm-hmm. what as to how you interpret the idea of a melancholic um story or setting yeah um, I think it goes back to uh, and my love of uh, Korean dramas, horror movies, uh, and thrillers. Um, Devil Inside, uh, Train to to Busan, um, uh, Old Boy, and such. Uh, which I would, especially the Old Boy and uh, Devil. Not devil. It's I saw the devil. Mm-hmm. Uh, both of those have uh, are very melancholic uh, in in that the ending, uh, the uh, a happy ending isn't guaranteed, and ex- and especially there's a lot of sad endings. Um, but I, 
how necrobiotic kind of interprets that is is that in in a lot of the actual plays that I've done is that there's a lot of sadness around uh, the place the uh, between the description of the weather the uh, macabre cadavers which uh, roam the streets the emptiness of Florence compared to uh, what we're used to uh, in this era um, all of that just kind of sets the tone for a very uh, melancholic oppressive setting mm -hmm. uh, and it, and usually the stories you have like your your characters do the best that they can but there there's still a lot of sadness present in that you can't you, you're not going to get that perfect ending um you you will progress the story forward and such but at least i mean this is off, obviously necrobiot can be played like however you want but mm -hmm. Necrobiotic that that I I play and, and that I feel like the setting really does well with is just kind of those stories where you don't know who who's the hero at the end and what you have to kind of think about what was actually accomplished um, and and I think the melancholy uh, helps bring to mind that joy of things a lot of times um, the comparison between joy and, and melancholy uh just makes the the joyous moments more prominent um which is something I, i'm very excited about and i i really like that when it comes out in games mm -hmm. now i will i will admit that when i will admit that one joke i was po i was pondering when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to the idea of melancholy mm -hmm. is um Essentially, Russian cynicism. I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure you've seen the meme of the, of the four cor the four corners of cl of classic literature. I don't think I have. <laughs> um, it tends to it tends to go like this: American mm -hmm. literature. I will die for freedom. British literature. I will die for honor. French literature. I will die for love. Russian literature. I will die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that. I think that that's perfect. Mm hmm. Oh. And when it com when it comes to when it, but when it comes to the setting something else that I've I very much noticed and this and this is mainly a um visual aesthetic thing is mm -hmm. throughout a lot of the art, the font work and the way the pages are presented in the um preview mm -hmm. the wor the word that kept coming to mind for me was art deco. Was that mm, intentional, yeah. or is that just a happy coincidence on my part? No, that's definitely... When we were looking through how we wanted it to, to be presented, and Adi, uh, Adi is the one who did the layout, uh, our artist is Haley Lee. And, and part of the reason why I chose her was because of her use of, of shadow and, and light and such, uh, which I think is a, a very much the Art Deco uh, style. Um and then the layout was just kind of pushed out from from that inspiration from the the art. So it just kind of all goes together. And I think Art Deco is a is a perfect like uh, name for a representation of what we're trying to go with uh, throughout the whole book. Mm -hmm. Now that uh, that does bring me that does bring me to <laughs> the to some to some aspects with the with the setup now. In keep in keeping with a vi with a very, there's definitely a very noir element to the approach, and mm -hmm. in per and in particular the fact that ev that everything everything begins and ends with the with the city of Florence. I've I've described cyberpunk and to and to a certain degree noir as akin to akin to the Greek labyrinth. Mm -hmm. Um, you know. There, there's to corridors that lead to more corridors, and hope to and hope to God you don't end up meeting the Minotaur. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but some, but one thing that I'm cu one thing that I'm curious about is it se it seems that a lot of it seems that a good chunk of character creation is based on a short list of archetypes. So. Mm -hmm. There's a part of me that's curious if there was some very early draft version that was using a more playbook-like setup, a la Powered by the Apocalypse, 
before before settling on the current um approach oh uh, so we, we've always went with with this approach to stuff uh we just um we, we call them jokers um uh, as kind of uh a our way of of uh, basically referencing playbooks which is kind of synonymous with power by the apocalypse um but yeah, we, we wanted uh, every character to have a set of skills that was unique to their their position in society. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so between like the engineer, the, the architect, the technophon, the technosophist, and the, the militia, each one brings something unique to the table that the others don't. Um, and even within that uh, archetype or Joker, uh, the different ways you can play the character uh, is drastically different. Um, and, and so I think it was just kind of uh, two two different designs that just uh, I think meshes wonderfully for uh, a player's experience, uh, just kind of bumping into each other. Mm-hmm. Now. That bring that brings me to the to the card system that you have that you have in mind. Now, mm-hmm. um, you've described the card system for Necrobiotic as akin to a deck builder. Um, mm-hmm. Were there so before before I get, before I get into the nitty gritty, I do have to ask: Were there any, were there any um, deck building games that got a lot of play that served as an influence for your design? Ooh. Um. Not that I can think of. I mean, I I know um uh and uh, and really the the other two had had way more to play with uh, the creation of this particular system. There was actually another TTRPG that they were going to use the system for, um, but then kind of ended up shifting to uh, Necro or El Genagio. Um, I mean, for for me, like uh, Lord of the Rings, as well as um, really kind of any of the deck builders or card games like Magic or um, uh, Yu Gi Oh. Uh, for my personal experience, were, were kind of uh, something that was in mind. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it was just kind of uh, I think just a, a perfect combination of, of things. Um, it's just I, I think the the important thing we wanted to to bring up was the fact that your deck would be a representation of your character. Um, and so wherever you took your deck uh, is where you're taking your character. And there's something like I, something I really like about that. And I don't know if I've ever actually been able to uh, to describe the importance of it in words, but um, it's just something of an ownership uh, to your when you can kind of bring it around in this this little deck. Now, with with that kind of thing in mind, I'd like I'd be I'd be curious I'd be curious to hear how how the particular deck plays a factor in character creation, advancement, mm-hmm. and in the core in the core resolution mechanics. Yeah, so we're actually going to be releasing a, a video for the um, the Kickstarter and, and as well as for public consumption uh, mm-hmm. that shows how to create your deck. Um, but uh, it, it's pretty easy. When you look at the character sheet, your features or stats are divided up into uh, hearts, uh, which is flesh. Uh, you have diamonds, which is steel, um, steam, which is clubs, and then, of course, uh, gears, which is spades. Mm-hmm. Um, each one is given a numeric value during character creation. Um, as you create your character, the higher the number, the better you are at that certain aspect. Each one is kind of associated with a sphere, like uh, hearts is flesh, uh, that's your social sphere. Um, diamonds is uh, steel, and that's kind of your physical. Um, and so, if you have a three in flesh, uh, you go to your you because every character or every person needs a full deck in order to create their own character deck. From mm-hmm. uh, you go from the lowest numeric value, which in our case is the ace, which is one. Uh, and then you go to that value, grabbing every card in between. So three of flesh would be ace of uh, hearts, two of hearts, and then three of hearts. Uh, and that 
stands as the basis of your deck as you do that with each of the the stats uh on your character sheet finally you add in a joker and then you decide um what type of special ability you want um either a jack or a queen uh and each of those are are kind of divided up into what you born with and what you have and then the other one is what training have you received um so you choose one of those and create one of those and then finally you can get another ability by adding in a flaw into your deck Ding. now and yeah all of that together that forms the basis of the your character deck um during play like the first uh the first moment of play you take your first breath uh and you draw up the six uh cards into your hand that you can see after shuffling your deck uh looking at the cards is kind of uh synonymous with like waking up and knowing like what spoons you have for certain things during the day Mm -hmm. so you can look at your deck and be like okay today will be or at least this first aspect of the day will be more social than than physical and stuff like that so you know uh what what you're kind of uh looking forward to for the rest of the the day or or for the player of the game um and whenever something comes up uh you are looking for a suit that matches the action so for diamond steel uh the physical sphere so if you're jumping or or doing anything athletic or running uh if you play diamonds you're automatically going to get a success other than that, you're looking for a combination that provides you an eight, and all of these different successes can accumulate uh, for uh, some pretty cool successes. So uh, that's pretty much the, the basis of the system. Um, you can, of course, like push your luck, which is blind, which is uh, pulling from the top of the deck and such. Um, and there's lots of little cool things, and the special abilities can alter play. Um, but yeah, that, that's that's kind of it. It's nice, it's simple, it's easy, uh, but it has a lot of nuance to it. Mm-hmm. Now, you mentioned you mentioned that one of the cards that you have that you're that you have to take at character creation is the Joker. Um, mm-hmm. Now, i i can I can infer some possibilities when it comes to the when it comes to the Joker, and I've I've always been a fan of some sort of wild card or extra effort mechanic. Um, Mm-hmm. What ends up? Ha- what, um, do- what particular effects does u- does utilizing the Joker bring into play? Yeah, the Joker is kind of your ace in the hole. It's uh, it's a success no matter what. Um, so it's always there to provide you an answer to a problem, no matter how uh difficult or or crazy the day might end up being. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's really fun to have in your deck, and definitely we encourage the GM and the player to come up with some special thing that occurs because of this moment. Um, and so, yeah, it's just kind of this nice little extra thing that you have your 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 special oomph for the day. Yeah. Now, because of the way the car- because of the way the card it the card um, motif is set up, um, mm-hmm. something I'm curious about. Especially since it's all about getting combinations to match or exceed an eight. Um, in play testing, have you had any instances of players utilizing their cards defensively? Yeah. Um, so the the conversation between the GM and the uh, the player um, is always reactive. Um, the GM. Uh, provides consequences based on what the players are trying to do. Uh, And then, even in combat, uh, instead of the GM rolling to hit or uh, or, or something like that, uh, they're instead saying, you're dealing with the consequences of being punched in the face or tripped by this character. Uh, You have to then play cards to nullify um, that consequence. Uh, So the whole game acts uh, very, um, uh, for the players, reactive um, to what's going on. Um, As well as, you know, obviously the the characters always are are free to do what what they want to do, but the GM provides the consequences associated with the things that they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, Which is nice, like um, the the GM doesn't ever have to, to roll. 
now given now given that given that particular um set given that particular setup mm -hmm. um my ne my next qu my next question it my next question is on the is on the special abilities um mm -hmm. is it is it a case how, is it a case where the, where they're only going to be able to be used once per scene or 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 once per session how what's the what's the advantages and disadvantages when it comes to utilizing um special abilities yeah so the special abilities are always uh activated when when they're in your deck um and some of them range from like um you get to draw an extra or you get to have an extra card in your hand at all times um or another suit will allow you a success within a, a different task um so it, it's really kind of a, a when you're doing character creation um there are two aspects to the special abilities one is uh because it's a jack or a queen um they also get to represent another card in the deck um, so it allows you to either double up on a card that you like uh, or uh, to have a, a pretty high numeric value um, of that card if you're if you're going for that. The trade-off is is that uh, the more useful your ability, the lower the numeric value of that card um, is. Um, and then the, vi the the opposite is true as well. If your ability is just kind of, decent or it's not that useful on a day-to-day -day basis uh you get to have a higher numeric value associated with that card um so it's just kind of like there there's kind of depth in, in that aspect uh that i've really enjoyed mm -hmm. now when it comes to the when it comes to the types that are that are mentioned on mm -hmm. the kickstarter page and also some of the pregens um mm -hmm. something that i'm curious about would you, would it be when it comes when it comes to the, when it comes to this sort of approach, um, mm -hmm. you can f you can file a lot of them down into either being classes or archetypes. Mm -hmm. um, where where on that paradigm would you would you say think things like architect, militia, and so on fit? Yeah, I would definitely uh, move it more towards uh, archetype uh, because I, I think class has a uh a rigid rigidity uh associated with it while archetype uh allows you to uh shift and and give priorities um so for instance like the militia is supposed to be the um uh they they are the judge the jury uh, they are the investigators and and so as you're you're playing one you get to kind of decide what which one of these you want to specialize in uh, and it, it could be any of these. Um, and so uh, the same militia or the same archetype could be more of a social character, um, uh, like kind of Watson. Uh, or you could be more investigative, like Sherlock. Um, you could also be more of a prosecutor. Uh, and I'm trying to think of a famous like cartoon or video game prosecutor. Jack McCoy. It's not, there it's, we not, go. it's not cartoon or video game, but it's but I'm using it. That sounds perfect. Yeah, you could be like that. So it kind of ranges on on how you uh, on how you want to be. Um, that's the same for each and every one of the classes or <laughs> archetypes. So, um, with yeah. with that in mind, I'd li I'd like to <laughs> I'd like to go I'd like to go down the list on the Kickstarter page mm -hmm. with them and. Get your get your vibe for for what for the general feel for them and how and how they can potentially develop. Yeah. Um, so I'll start at the top with architect. Mm hmm. Uh. All right. So architect. Um. Architect usually ends up being like the the medical as well as um uh the social um. Uh, character uh, partly because in society because scientists are seen as uh have they kind of replaced the wealthy in in terms of class uh they are shown a lot of respect mm -hmm. uh so you could be a very respectful tenured uh scientist uh who doesn't really have to do much nowadays but 
enjoys a uh, a luxury uh, from his or her position. You could also be a kind of antisocial uh, scientist who just uh, spends every night working on cadavers to to upgrade the construct model that that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just kind of like any of us. <laughs> Um, militia. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think we, we already went through that. Uh, yeah, it, it's kind of the, uh, the gambit of, uh, the whole law, uh, or the treatment of law in most societies from, uh, law enforcement to the prosecution to investigating, uh, to even being just a, a civil counselor, mm. uh, and, and organizer. Uh, your whole job is to keep the peace, so however your character believes in doing that, uh, and whatever aspects they want to focus on, uh, you're you're free to do. Um, I want to appreciate. I want to take a moment to appreciate your restraint that you did not make a Judge Dread joke, even though you had the perfect <laughs> opportunity to. Yeah, yeah. Every everyone has been uh, equating uh, uh, the militia with Judge Dread. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's cool. That's cool. It's, Judge Dread is very violent, uh, and this setting, uh, while it can be violent, definitely like. To kill someone is a horrendous taboo that all humanity shares. Um, and so I feel Judge Dredd is, uh, while a funny comparison, uh, is not quite accurate. I'd, I'd say, I'd say, I'd say a bit, I'd say a more apt, a more apt would be, um, would be Dirty Harry. Mm. No, I, f I feel that. Um, I've watched that, but yeah. I mean... I mean, yeah. It's, I mean, yeah. Harry Callahan is 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 certainly is certainly willing to you to you to utilize that revolver of his, but mm -hmm. um, more often, but more often than not, intim intimidation wor works wonders. Um, yeah. As the yeah, I'll, I've I I joked about in the past that a lot of people have have um, ignored the look cool factor in this mm -hmm. in the sense that. And this, and we see this in the natural world, of of um, animals trying to make themselves look dangerous so that so that predators think that they are dangerous. More than yeah. one army has bluffed their way into victory. Um, no, I I, uh, I feel that I feel like uh, it's definitely. Um, uh, it, it, that that right there is a, an aspect of the game that I, I really enjoy, which is yeah that, that kind of bluffing um, because like a, a lot of the times you're trying to um, to to push your way and to create something in this society that's a little bit better than than what you're playing around with, and it takes a, a certain individual to to make that happen. Um, I'm always excited to hear the stories that people are able to tell through it. It just warms my heart. What the hell was that? That is a car. Hey, I'm in Baltimore, so like. <laughs> so, it's so, ev so every so everyone's an asshole until they get their requisite amount of Old Bay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ba basically. Um. <laughs> So next is the Technosophist, and I'm g I get the feeling this is the one that people mispronounce the most. Call it a hunch. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tech, uh, technosophist or Technosophist. Uh, however, I, I tell people, you know what? It's a made-up word. Just go with it. Mm -hmm. uh, say it however you want. Oh, uh, and and though, so this is uh, the one that is kind of opposite of the architects. While the architects are. Uh, held aloft by society, and um, uh, they are associated with the um, uh, with the newer technology, such as constructs. The technosophists are used to the older tech, which is really our tech. Um, looking back on it, so they they play around with computers and like uh, V tubes and stuff like that. Um, oh, they're uh, filthy weebs. Got it. Exactly right. They they uh, because electricity is harder to come by. Um, Florence has no need of it, and and so um, all this old stuff has been moved and shifted to the junk piles outside of Florence. But the technosophists believe that there is still some. Um, 
utility for for those stuff and and kind of dig through the piles and try to make something out of it so they have uh like uh little drones and stuff that they can use they're really good with um uh signaling as well as communication over long distances they, they just kind of everything that we take for granted nowadays they have access to and can play around with um, in a very kind of disassociated meshing of different technologies way. Um, but yeah, in, in that case, you could you could be like an inquisitive uh, inventor uh, going out through the junk piles, uh, creating things from the old tech. Uh, you could also be more of a social person in, in that you are uh, part of the Technosophist uh, Council and you're trying to make uh, the Technosophist something more than it is uh, today. Uh, and then, you know, they have access to all these uh, cool inventions uh, that they have. So you could totally just, like, throw down with people if you if you want. Like, the, you, the Technosophists um, are, are a lot of fun to, to play around with. Yep. Yeah. Um... Next on the next is the Technophant. Ooh, the Technophant is one of my favorites. Um, I got to play one the other day, and I don't get to play this game often. Usually, I'm running it. Um, Welcome to the Forever GM Club, my friend. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's um, was it uh, Kill a Kill? Uh, if you ever read that manga, yep. Uh, well, yeah, it, it's those like powered um, uh, kind of humanoid mech suits, almost like Iron Man. Um, and you you are part of a very special division of of individuals who get to use and and train with these pieces of armor. Your job is almost uh, equivalent to the scouts from uh, Attack on Titan in that you're exploring the wilderness of the old world. Uh, in the hopes that there's something else outside of, of Florence. Um, and so whether you want to be a tracker, um, an investigator outside the walls, or if you just want to do martial arts uh, and, and be a badass with your Iron Man-esque uh, techno-powered armor, uh, it's completely up to you. Um, though I definitely feel out of all of them that the techno fonts have... Uh, <laughs> Definitely more of a lean towards that um, that badass fighty uh, style of, of play, uh, which is which is so cool. I, I've played them in a couple of different ways, and I've definitely enjoyed the um, that aspect. Um, one thing that we leaned into um, from the uh, the translation um, was a thing that the um, the techno fonts used on their back to carry their equipment was called a uh, a casket. Uh, that's how it's translated. Mm -hmm. For the our Italian uh, friends, uh, this was just like a box, right? A box that you held things in. But for the English speakers, like we have a different vision of what a casket is, um, and so we kind of leaned in on the casket option because I, I like that kind of metal feel of it. Uh, and so the, the technosophists of this version kind of have these caskets uh, where their armor uh, resides in when, they're, when they don't have it on them. Mm -hmm. And it's also a place to store their body if they ever die. I, uh, I, will, I will admit that, the, that the, whole, the whole storing the armor and, and possibly calling upon it, the vibe, I get from, the vibe I get out of that is not necessarily Iron Man, but mm -hmm. something more along the lines of, um, of the Tokusatsu series Common Rider. Oh, I have not, I have not seen that yet. Uh, but I, I should. It sounds like. Um, well, you're you're not gonna you're not gonna be short you're not gonna be short on options with with that because that's because that series has been around since seventy two. Oh, excellent. Yeah, like. Um, Iron Man is definitely the, I guess, the more visual, um, uh, kind of, um, uh, representation we have in media right now, but, like, I kind of feel more uh, along the lines of Kill a Kill, or, uh, I, I forget what the American movie version of it was called, but, Wait, uh, are, wait, are you saying, wait, Kill, 
Wait, kill the kill. Oh, no, no, not kill the kill. Not that. Oh, man. You're uh, thinking that all it? you need is kill. Yes, there you go. All you need is kill. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. How the, yeah, how yeah. the hell do you do that? <laughs> Both have kill in the title. <laughs> Oh man, yeah, that would be a, a weird uh, techno font um, <laughs> with the stretchy is it, fabric. Is it, is it wrong that I I want I want to commission somebody to do that? <laughs> no, I think that was hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh man, I I love Kill the Kill, but definitely all I was the other one is what I was thinking about. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Yeah, you you were think you were thinking of all you need is kill, which yeah. was referred to as Edge of Tomorrow, which which in my not so humble opinion is a lame title because it doesn't tell me anything. Yeah, I I like the original uh, uh uh was it book and graphic novel infinitely more than the English American version of it. Um but yeah, that that's a whole thing. But I, I really like the way they did their little suits, and I, I think that's kind of a, yeah. a good way to 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 show it off or, or what we were trying to go for. And lastly is the engineer, which, um, all, which as soon as I as soon as I see that, I immediately I immediately want to ask, how do I t how do I stop some mean Mother Hubbard from tearing me a structure superfluous new beehive? Yes! <laughs> that, that's basically the engineer. Like, they have the ability to create weapons on the fly. Um, they are the specialists of um, the other aspect of technology nowadays. Uh, so there, there's kind of two things that have advanced, uh, which is uh, medicine and, and science, uh, and then, like, uh, steam-powered and steampunk technology. Mm -hmm. uh, it's electricity and, and power plants and stuff like that are, are just hard to, to keep going. Um, and so they are the ones who keep all that aspects of society together. Um, and so, yeah, that the engineer of uh, Team Fortress is a very good uh, representation of, of kind of their, their style of play. Uh, but, you know, once again, you could, you could go all these different routes. You could be more of an intellectual inventor, or you could be, like, this person who is not only smart, but, you know, this, this badass uh, fighter who can utilize these weapons in ridiculous ways. Um, and, and so it, it's kind of up to you to, to figure out what type of engineer you want to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, when it comes to advancement with these, with these particular archetypes, is it... Mm -hmm. is is advancement is advancement something that there is a universal pool that you draw from, or does each of do each of these archetypes have a have a um have a sm have a slightly smaller umbrella that they, that they exclusively pick from? No, it's a universal. Uh, so every archetype has a list of skills that are unique to their own. Um, but uh, character advancement um, allows you to remove cards from your deck. Uh, add cards to your deck, uh, and then also add special ability cards to to your deck, um, and and so in that way you're you're playing higher cards. Your probability of having those higher cards or the cards that you want increases, mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, inventing and creating different abilities for your deck um, as you continue to progress is, is something uh, that you can do as well. Yeah. Now. Because of because of the the way the, the way the um four the four suits work, mm -hmm. is the, is this is this particular system one where it's generally not advisable to dump all of your advancements into one suit? Uh, no, that that's actually uh, a a valid and uh, strategic way to play. I mean, there's different ways you can create your character and and progress. Um, I mean, for instance, uh, having, uh, focusing on one aspect would give you higher numeric values, uh, within that, those suits. Uh, and if you were trained in skills of those suits, allows you to create eight, uh, a, a lot more, uh, easier, uh, than someone else who would have lower numeric value cards in their hand. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and so it's just kind of how your character, how you want to build out your character. There's a lot of strategy involved with that aspect of it. 
uh, which is something I really enjoy too with character creation. Um, so it's just kind of depending on what type of play you want and what type of character you're trying to go for. All right. Now, when it now um, with that with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind, um, <laughs> when it com- when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to the traits, um. Especially on the especially on the examples, I noticed that some of them are just listed, and some of them have the dot um, filled in. Is it a, is it a case where there's some that are tiered? Uh, yeah. So um, every every skill uh, it, you are either trained in it or not, and having that fillable bubble means that you are trained in it. If you are trained in something, you get to play two cards. If you are not, you can only play one card. All right. Yeah, so that kind of yeah, it allows you to approach things in uh <laughs> in different ways. I'm guess I'm guessing I'm guessing that because of this there there's a bit, there's a bit of a leaning to- towards um towards use using hot using high value cards what you at at later levels using high value cards for untrained instances and you and using slightly slightly lower um ones. Yeah. When, you're, when you are when you are trained yeah definitely and are you all are is are you always operating under a rule of six or is or are there means to modify the number of cards that you have available yeah like there's there's one special ability that one of the pregens has which uh allows them to have seven cards in their hand instead of the the normal six mm-hmm. uh, um, so, and then, uh, not increasing your hand size, but there's also, uh, an ability that lets you use another suit in place of what is normally required. So, like, I think there's, uh, there's one where you can use, like, your, your steam stat instead of your gear for, like, advanced medicine. Um, uh, there's kind of different ways to, to add some strategy to your character and, and allow you to approach situations differently. All right. When it comes when it comes to resolution, is it all is it is it typically a case of you're either you're either you're either throwing you're either throwing down value or you're throwing down suits? Yeah, it it actually uh, is both. Um, so you you do a combination of the two. If I had like a five of diamonds and a three of diamonds, and I play both of those cards, uh, that would yield three successes. Um, and, and so. It's kind of up to you and and how much consequences you're dealing with. Um, does does that mean that somebody could play a low card but still get a success if if it's a matching suit? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you could like yeah, just get an ace of hearts if you're doing something within if you're trying to convince someone and that's a success. It's prob- it, it, I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty sure in that case the GM would say you succeed you succeed by the skin of your teeth or. The, or the case of a, a um a explosion with shrapnel going everywhere but you somehow by the grace of god end up not getting hit <laughs> yeah it's definitely that lower end of uh of uh, utility and definitely like uh we encourage the gms and the players to kind of make that story uh based on um out there what, what what cards are playing and such mm-hmm. uh which also kind of goes into the uh the tarot deck that we're we're uh the rules for it that we're making for the uh the game uh which should be really interesting and i i love the tarot deck especially the different meanings that each cards are associated with and i think that'll just add another another cool aspect uh for the for the game um well it's fun it's now bringing up a tarot deck is a case of you you ha- you had my you had my curiosity. Now you have my attention. <laughs> but oh yeah. But more on but more on point. <laughs> Use um, when it comes to utilizing a tarot deck, which is something I am very very familiar with. I have <laughs> I have several tarot decks of my own. I've u- I've used nice. them. I've used them in I've used them in game where I'll um, I'll get <laughs> I'll. Do- at the start, at the start of a in-game day, I'll get, I'll do, I'll draw one of the arcana. That's a reading. That's yeah. Bas- basically, a means of saying this may happen or this may not happen, and it may, it may help you or it may screw you. 
<laughs> of course, of course, since I'm the one saying it, they don't trust me anyway, so they think it's going to screw them. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fair. <laughs> but are are you not doing your GM? Are you not doing your due diligence as a GM if you're not making your parent um, players rampantly paranoid? Yeah, yeah, they should be like, "What the heck's going to go down?" And you're like, "I don't know, something yeah. awesome, hopefully." <laughs> oh. They us they usually have the approach. Uh, if you'll pardon if. I would say pardon my French, but it's but it's my show, so yeah. I think we've that, been cursing, so we're the, good. The approach that they the approach that my players tend to have with me is, you're fucked, and it's only gonna get rougher from here. Aw, yeah, which is a good approach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but when it comes to the tarot deck, one I can mm -hmm. see the min how the minor arcana would be used, largely in the same way the same way that just a playing card deck would be used because. Well, that's what it is. <laughs> yeah. Just with just with one extra step. But mm -hmm. what about the major arcana? How would that get utilized in Necrobiotic when it comes to this um, tarot deck? Yeah. So we we kind of um, we're gonna have a archetype called Children of the River uh, who will have special ways to utilize the tarot deck. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is a, a whole thing on its own, but for people, for the rules for kind of using the tarot deck for standard aspects of play, mm -hmm. uh, the major arcana replace the face cards in, in that aspect. And so um, it allows you to kind of uh, have a better reflection of what each card uh, represents, uh, because the major arcana have a lot of depth and um and understanding for for each one uh so it just kind of uh, allows you to um to play around more with the abilities and to have cards that actually like instead of a um a, a spade of jacks uh representing an extra card that you get to have in your hand you get to actually choose like a major arcana that represents uh something more um which is it's just really cool yeah um I'd look f once once the second Fatum deck. I'd look I'd look forward to I'd look forward to trying to see how I can integrate that with um, character creation in Necrobiotic. Um, yeah, like oh, I, I'm so excited for for that aspect. It's going to be really fun. Oh, um, because I is I now the now I do I do have the first Fatum deck, but that one wouldn't mm -hmm. really work for this because that's that's a pure fantasy setup. Mm-hmm. And well the. While there's certainly fantastical elements with necrobiotic, it it um trying to trying to fit it would be the equivalent of having Reed Richards drawn and quartered. <laughs> oh, fair. <laughs> um, okay. But now, with with all with all that in mind, now I I know that I know that I know that um these kind of things are in flux. But what are you shooting for as far as a total page count for the book? Oh, so it, it's probably going to be around two fifty to three hundred, uh, depending on the the stretch goals. Um, and we have a, a lot of cool ones uh, coming up, but but yeah, it'll definitely fall between there. I'm I'm a huge fan of of presentation of information, a very beautiful way. Mm -hmm. The Genesis uh, Rebirth does this very well. Oh, and, yeah. oh yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah, and and so that that's kind of our take on it is just taking our time with every page and allowing the the reader to kind of breathe and enjoy the uh, atmosphere of the game uh, while also kind of going through the information. Yeah. Um. And since since you mentioned atmosphere, I'm cur um because of how much of a audio file that I, that I am, I'm cu I'm curious I'm curious what sort of what sort of musical cues you 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 would see with with a necrobiotic um campaign? Ooh, yeah. So we are uh, working on a uh, a little soundtrack for uh, necrobiotic, uh, and uh, I know my uh, inspirations have been like uh, on the nature of daylight. Uh, I think by Richard. Uh... Oh man, I want to say Marx, but it feels wrong. Um and uh as well as uh was it Lud Ludiciano? Mm -hmm. uh, so these people who have kind of mixed uh sad uh tones and notes with uh very beautiful moments in my opinion, and that's kind of gonna be represented in the soundtrack as well with 
a nice mix of uh, these kind of melancholic tones, uh, but then also having that uh, that steampunk vibe with the kind of electronic music. Uh, Gunship is another, um, uh, I guess, uh, uh, influence uh, when I think about the music for Necrobiotic. Uh, and Gunship does such fantastic uh, job with storytelling via their music. Uh, and their videos too. Yeah, I will. I will admit that. I will admit that my own my own interpretation leans mm-hmm. leans a little bit differently. Um, mm-hmm. On some on some, uh, the two com- the two composers I could see myself using a lot if I was running um ne- if I was running a necrobiotic mm-hmm. campaign myself is Hiromi Uehara. Mm-hmm. And um, Philip Glass. Philip oh, um, Glass. I have I haven't heard of either of those, or maybe I've heard of the first. But Hiromi Uehara uh, is a ja- is a jazz fusion um, pianist who mm-hmm. has a who um while she does a whole lot of traditional work, she has integrated some some electronic work in, into some of, into some of her albums. Um, mm-hmm. Philip Glass, who in my humble opinion, is a very underrated composer when it comes to film and and a lot of his other works. Um, mm-hmm. I first was introduced to him through his work on on um, Koyan Iskatsi. Mm-hmm. That that very that very strange non non word art art film that came that came out in the eighties and spawned two sequels. Mm-hmm. Um, Interesting. I've u- I've used him I've used him in in um in set in settings where I wa- where I want to emphasize a we- a weirdness or a thing or things not being right. Yeah. Oh, then that, that's definitely like <laughs> that, that's perfect. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, there's definitely that here, and like I'm I'm always interested to see what people uh view uh the necrobiotic kind of soundtrack as like in their mind and such. Yeah, uh, that's been fascinating to um, to to see and, and to hear. Yeah, the th- there there's prob there's probably there's probably a few others that that I can I can think of, but those are those are the main those mm-hmm. are the main ones that co- that come to mind. Oh. Yeah. No, oh, definitely. I'd say. I'd say I'd say may, I'd say maybe maybe for, maybe as an exposition scene using using time from in, from inception, but that might Ooh, be a yeah bit, that might be a little bit too obvious. <laughs> no, I I feel that one like mm-hmm. uh, that that would be really cool, and I, I'm a huge fan of uh, what is it Hans Zimmerman? Yeah, is Hans, it? Hans Zimmer. I do th- uh, yeah, I think Hans that Zimmer. some people overrate Hans Zimmer, and he does have his bad habits. When when it comes mm-hmm. to composing, but t- but um, as the saying goes, you have to give the devil his due. <laughs> yeah, like he, he he's got some good tracks, and uh, uh, like he he definitely communicates beautiful moments very well. And so, like even if he's kind of used for everything now, uh, you, you got to tip your hat to. Him. Although I'd pay, I'd pay some good money to see Harry Gregson Williams get some more work. He doesn't seem to do a whole lot. Which one? Uh, what has he been a part of? Um, he's he's done he's done incidental pieces for a lot of movies mm-hmm. over the years. But I'd I'd say for a lot of nerds, his his most famous work is going to be through Metal Gear Solid. Mm. Oh man, yeah, that is. Uh, he's he's got some great stuff there. Like his, I love me some Metal Gear Solid. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Oh man! Now, give now, given the given the given the uh, page count, um, mm-hmm. what would you be sh- what would you be shooting for for the for the um, PDF version of the release? I know that the physical version is going to take more time because um, the embodiment of suffering yeah. is dealing with printers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, uh... So actually, the um, the the book um, just needs to go through editing at this point in time. So we're looking at a uh, an alpha uh, uh, 
PDF copy of the book um, being distributed around quarter four. Uh, hopefully quarter three, but uh, probably it'll end up being quarter four of, of this year. Um, yeah, it just needs to go through editing uh, and then layout. So, um, yeah, we're, we're actually very close to um, uh, to, to releasing it. Oh, all right, and I'll, I'll certainly be looking forward to it. And, for, and as an aside, I do want to offer my congratulations on getting... Three to- over three times past your initial your initial goal because you're asking for, oh, yeah. <laughs> you're asking for 10k and you're at 30 you're at 37.4k yeah it's it's been really awesome and uh i i hope we can continue knocking out the the stretch goals and stuff uh probably going to restructure the stretch goals a little bit because a lot of the stuff I want in the book so badly, uh, like uh, Petr Nalo and his short story, and, and he did like Helm Gas and, and Cult and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Matthew Dawkins and, and all these like awesome writers, uh, Dra- Drake, uh, as well as, uh, I'm sorry, Drake, uh, and Noir Enigma. Like, I'm so excited to see their work and stuff. Um, so it, it's just like, yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then more art. Like, I, I want to continue putting more of this beautiful art into the book yeah um and i will note i will note in the interest of full disclosure that of the (laughs) of the 590 backers you can count you can count the name of this monk in the in that list (laughs) it's much appreciated Ah. like it's uh it's, it's always like awesome to hear when someone's like yeah i like this enough to to support it like it's it's humbling even like even after the after we've gone through like uh, the initial success of it. It's always like, oh, mm. God, they like our stuff. Mm. This is weird. <laughs> oh. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to brave the hell of time zones and come all the way up here to the temple to enjoy the insanity at play here. Oh, no, I love the temple. This is this is awesome. It's, it's you know, it's nice uh, hors d'oeuvres, good beverages, uh, a nice AC, you know, it, it feels nice here. Yeah. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to whether it's to discuss music, to to atone to atone for your failures in the Weebery, or just or just to shit post, the door is <laughs> always open. As I oh, often say, as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Heck yeah, I have been drinking. Uh, what is it? Cherry Blossom, which is just like. This is, is I, I think it's a, a pale wheat ale, uh, so it's been tasty, and I appreciate it. Um, I've, I've, um, I mostly, I mostly go with locals, which means I, which means I've been having summit for the for a good chunk of the night. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also because I learned my lesson from the holidays from the, over the holidays, and I'm not going through absinthe again. Holy, holy hell! Yeah, yeah, that's uh, a <laughs> that's a, that's a tough one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I've stopped drinking um, Everclear. I just feel like it's bad for me uh, at this point of my life. So <laughs> I'll just but, I'll go with something else. Mm-hmm. But we, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the mm-hmm. show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>